question for you. What is it about silence that's awkward in our culture? You ever notice that? Silence has become something that, for many of us, we run away from. Or maybe that's just me and my household. Anyone else relate? Many homes, the TV's on from the time people wake up in the morning, even through the night after they go to bed. We're continuing in our series, Rhythms, Practicing the Ways of Jesus. When we look to Scripture, we see all these disciplines that Jesus practiced that we also need to take into our lives and practice. Richard Foster wrote the book, Celebration of Discipline, and he looks at 12 areas of the spiritual life where we need to practice these disciplines. He said, the disciplined person is the person who can do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. Not only do many people look to avoid spiritual disciplines, we avoid the word discipline. We don't want to discipline our children. We don't want to be disciplined at work. This whole idea of discipline has almost become a bad word. Anyone else notice that? This topic of spiritual discipline is a well-written topic. There's many, many books from the Celebration of Discipline. Uh, we can see ones called uh, The Spiritual Direction. There's many books written on this idea of spiritual discipline. I want to share with you Henry Nouwen in his book, Spiritual Direction, said the goal of spiritual direction is spiritual formation. The ever-increasing capacity to live a spiritual life from the heart. A spiritual life cannot be formed without discipline, practice, and accountability. There are many spiritual disciplines, he said. Almost anything that regularly asks us to slow down and order our time, our desires and thoughts, that contradict selfishness, impulsiveness, or hurried fogginess of mind. Those can be spiritual disciplines. As we look at this outward discipline of silence and solitude, I've heard many people seek silence and solitude, but they throw in a TV or earbuds, or does that not take away from the whole idea of silence? Foster again said the spiritual disciplines are things that we do. We must never lose sight of this fact. It is one thing to talk piously about the solitude of heart, but if that does not somehow work us into our experiences, then we have missed the point of the disciplines. There's very little opportunity in our day-to-day -to, -day to find silence. Whether you have small children, grown children, no children, if you are employed or unemployed, silence is something that's hard to find in 2020. Would you agree? They said the average person spends three hours a day on social media, 180 minutes a day on social media. And I've got good news for some of you. You're above average. There's some who are not. This average of 180 minutes on social media, where does the silence come from? I want to share a story. It's about a monk who is looking to join the order of monks. And when he gets there, he finds out that the head monk says, this is actually a silent order. So to join this order... There's absolute silence. And in 15 years, you'll get the opportunity to speak again. So he thinks hard about it, and he takes on this task of the order of the silent monk. He works diligently, and people like him. He's very disciplined in what he does and very helpful, and 15 years seems to pass quickly. The head monk comes to him, meets him in the cafeteria, and said, 15 years has passed. Would you like to say something? He thought, and he said, yeah, the porridge in the mornings could use a bit more sugar. 
So the head monk shakes his head in acknowledgement and continues another 15 years of absolute silence. The 15 years passes, the head monk catches him doing laundry and says, your 15 years is up, is there anything you'd like to share? He said, yeah, the linen is a little thin in the winter. If we could have better linen in the winter. So sure enough, the head monk acknowledges another 15 years. 45 years now has passed. And he gets asked, your 15 years is up. Is there anything you'd like to share? And he says, I've decided I would like to leave the silent order of the monks. The head monk looked at him and said, I'm not surprised. All I've heard from you is complaints since you got here. <laughs> How are we at being silent? And do we use our words when we use them to complain or to uplift? Foster said, without silence, there's no solitude. Through silence, or though silence sometimes involves the absence of speech, it always involves the act of listening. He continued, solitude is the creation of an open, empty space in our lives by purposely abstaining from interactions with, interactions with other human beings so that freed from competing loyalties, we can be found by God. It does not take long to look at our schedule, in our home, at our workplace, to find out we have many competing loyalties trying to draw at our attention. And lots of times that can distract us from God. Last week we had looked at steps for simplicity, and I want to show you that simplicity rolls into this idea of solitude. One of the steps was to, to develop a deeper appreciation of creation. And I had said to go out and spend time in God's creation. The next was to remove any distractions that distract you from seeking God. That is what solitude and silence brings us to, the idea of seeking God. How are we when it comes to seeking God? More importantly, what do we see in Scripture? I'm going to invite you to turn to Mark chapter 1, and I think I have the text to come up so you can read it off the screen or you can turn there. Mark chapter 1. Because I think it's important to see what does Jesus give us for an example of silence and solitude. Mark chapter 1, picking up at verse 9, it says, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and angels attended him. The start of Jesus' ministry begins in solitude. And so often, as believers, we are blind to that fact in our life. We're so busy that we forget to slow down and spend time with God. We jump down to verse 35 as we go through here. And it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere, somewhere else to a nearby village so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So they traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. Jesus' ministry begins with this idea of solitude. Oftentimes we find him off in a solitary place on his own. What he didn't have with him was an iPhone, iPod, earbuds. He was in silence with God. Silence and solitude. Turning over to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Jesus feeds the 5,000. 
And prior to that, he had sent out the 12. Verse 7, he had sent out the 12, and then they come back to him, picking up at verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going, and they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. And if you recall what happens from here, the crowds followed. They did not get that solitary place. This is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. But then from there, Jesus gets off in the water and finds that solitary place. We can find again in Luke's Gospel nine occurrences of Jesus going off to a solitary place. So the question is, why don't we do that? We see this example from Jesus, but yet oftentimes it's ignored in our practice and in our faith. Gary Moon said, Solitude is one of the most fundamental of all Christian disciplines. In solitude, we learn to unplug from the noise and the crowd of the world for the purpose of being with God and learning to hear his voice better. In solitude, we become free from the convulsion of pleasing others and our own desires so that we can better please God. And in this wasted time, he quotes it, as many people think this solitude is wasted time, he says, in this wasted time of solitude, God's whispered secret is often heard. He longs to make us his friend. How hard is it to get disconnected from social media, unplugged from all those distractions, and be connected with God? Oftentimes we have so many things drawing at us, tugging us away. We live in a day where we need to intentionally unplug and find that silence and solitude. I want to share with you what you will find in silence and solitude. The first thing is that you will find peace and quiet. Isn't that what most people say? If I could only just have some peace and quiet. I know lots of times with little kids in the house, it's like, could you, could you just head out so we could get some peace and quiet? And then when they do, you turn on the TV or you, you get all these other distractions so we don't even get that peace and quiet. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know that I am God. Can we commit to being still? To finding that peace and quiet? The next thing we find in silence and solitude is we'll find ourselves. And I found an article here that touches on this. Seven science-backed reasons you should spend time alone. Lots of times, science-backed reasons aren't ones I'd like to promote, but I, I want to read these to you. Science-backed reasons why you should spend time alone. Alone time increases empathy. Solitude increases productivity. Solitude sparks creativity. Being alone can help you build mental strength. Solitude may reduce behavior problems in kids. Now, I had to think about that for a second. So I'm not sure if that means if I'm in a solitude place, I just don't see the behavior of the kids, or if the kids are in a solitude place, they just can't be bad. But it reduces behavior problems with kids. Being alone gives you an opportunity to plan your life. I would say your faith walk. Plan your life. And solitude helps you to know yourself. Solitude helps us to find ourself. God has created each and every one of us so uniquely. But it's not just our mind that we need to pay attention to. When was the last time you stopped and paid attention to your body? What would your body say to you if you stopped long enough to listen? 
Would it say, I need some rest? Would it say, I need some recovery for maybe an injury or an ailment? Would it say, I need some exercise? Would it say something even deeper that we're not even slow enough to listen to, that we need to go and seek some sort of medical attention? Our bodies tell us lots of things. But we can be so busy that we don't stop and listen to what our body says. Silence and solitude offers that time that you can slow down and listen to what your body's saying. It gives you a time where you can focus on your life, focus on your faith walk. And that brings us into the next one, is to focus on God. Silence and solitude will allow you to find God. Lots of times I hear people that, where was God when this? And Tom, a great, great message. And he touched on some of that, the questions. And I've seen people that in their prayer life, it's like, God, I need this, and God, I need this, and, and this, and, and what about me, and how come? And when you're done talking, your prayer's over. That's a one-way conversation. Silence and solitude is when you stop and you listen for that still, small voice and what God is speaking to you. What's God saying to you? Richard Foster had said that loneliness often is confused with solitude, but he said loneliness is inner emptiness. Solitude is inner fulfillment. Wouldn't it be great to be fulfilled this morning, knowing that God is in control and that you're in tune with Him? So I want to give you some steps for solitude. I don't know if you are a bath person, but the bath can be a very good place to shut everything out and just spend time with God. I want to give you some practical that you can put into your life easily. Maybe you get up in the morning and the house is quiet. Before you make the house noisy, take some of that time in silence and solitude. Maybe the kids are up when you get up. So you need to get up 15 minutes earlier. Take that time. Maybe if it's in the car, you shut your radio off and spend time listening to what God's saying to you. I know for a group this big, there's lots of different family dynamics and makeups. So I would encourage you to work with your family and how that looks. If you have small children, Maybe you need to make an arrangement with your spouse that they help out, that you guys can pair off with each other to get that solitude and silence. Maybe there's no small children in your house and you have the ability to take that time together with your spouse in different parts of the house or maybe in different areas outside and spend time together but apart in solitude. I encourage you to find some ways. My challenge for you today is that today, February 9th, 2020, you find 5 to 15 minutes. Is that, is that a manageable amount of time? 5 to 15 minutes today of no distractions, no earbuds, TVs, nothing. Just you and God. And lots of times people confuse the solitude and they, well, this is my Bible study. No, set your Bible aside. Fit that in in your day also. But only take with you a blank sheet of paper and something to write with. And spend time with God. And my bigger challenge this week is that you find one half hour to a full hour of silence and solitude for you to stop and listen to what God is saying to you and truly to hear what he's speaking into you. You need to sometimes stop this enough so that we, we have those ears open. Present your request to God, but then be silent 
and listen to what it is that he has to say. And then if you're a married couple, meet back with your spouse and share with them about that time. Share with them what God spoke into your life. Did you come away feeling recharged? Did you come away feeling tired? How did you come back from that? Maybe you have a family member or a church family member or friend, and that's who you'll share with. And make that accountability that I'm going to commit this time to hear what God is saying to me. But there needs to be a balance between solitude and community. And I want to read to you what Henry Nguyen said in his book, Spiritual Direction. He said, The spiritual life rests on a paradox. Without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live the spiritual life. So this is a discipline that is not practiced often, and he said, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live the spiritual life. Yet we cannot live our spiritual lives alone. Although we need solitude to know God, we require a faithful community to hold us accountable. We need to learn how to listen to the Word of God, ever present within our heart. We need the disciplines of study and the spiritual practice to discern the Word of God in words of Scripture. We need the church or faith community that provides opportunity for worshiping and sharing, engaging in mutual, uh, mutual correction and bearing of burdens, confessing faults, offering forgiveness, and celebrating life. We also need guides, spiritual friends, a spiritual director, or a spiritual accountability group that can function for as a safe place to bear our soul. Isn't that what the church should be? Is spiritual directors, spiritual friends, a spiritual group where we can bear our soul with each other and be uplifted. So we need that balance of both community and solitude. So this morning, if you're hearing that, I know there's some that solitude is their comfort place. And they get a lot of time in solitude. What I would encourage you this week is that you shut off the other things. You shut off the things competing for you. And you make the commitment this week to community. That you reach out to that community. Like-minded believers that you just can hold each other up, hold each other accountable. We as a church body need to commit this week to slow down and be still enough to hear the quiet voice of God. Will you make that commitment with me today? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, God, you know each of our hearts. You know what our hurts are. You know what's holding us back from a committed life to you. So God, I pray that this week we are all bold enough to seek you, to seek you in the quiet, to slow down our lives so that we can hear your voice, God, that we open our hearts and minds to hear what you're saying to us. So God, we lift each and every one up here today. We ask for you to guide them and lead them as they go from here to give us the strength and courage to live a life that brings honor and glory to you. We are so grateful for your spirit that dwells within us. We are so grateful for the gift of your son and for the blessing that we have to be reconnected back to you, God, through him. So, God, we just pray that as we go from here today, you continue to be with us and that we continue to be still and hear your voice. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.